language, UN languages plus Portuguese and Hindi. And remember that under the quirky Zoom system, you need to go to the Korean button to use Arabic. So now, without further delay, I will hand over to Dr. Tedros. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, after my statement, I uh, will leave. I will not be staying for the Q&A. And my colleagues will continue because I have uh, another commitment. So I'd like to ask you uh, my apologies for that in advance. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, this week, we will reach 20 million registered cases of COVID-19 and 750,000 deaths. Behind these statistics, there is a great deal of pain and suffering. Every life lost matters. I know many of you are grieving and that this is a difficult moment for the world. But I want to be clear. There are green shoots of hope, and no matter where a country, a region, a city, or a town is, it's never too late to turn the outbreak around. There are two essential elements to addressing the pandemic effectively. Leaders must step up to take action, and citizens need to embrace new measures. Some countries in the Mekong region, New Zealand, Rwanda, and many island states across the Caribbean and the Pacific were able to suppress the virus early. New Zealand is seen as a global exemplar, and over the weekend, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern celebrated 100 days with no community transmission, while stressing the need to remain cautious. Rwanda's progress is due to a similar combination of strong leadership, universal health coverage, well-supported health workers, and clear public health communications. All testing and treatment of COVID-19 is free in Rwanda, so there are no financial barriers to people getting tested. And when people test positive for the virus, they are isolated, and health workers then visit every potential contact and test them also. Getting the basics right provides a clear picture of where the virus is and the necessary targeted actions to support transmission and save lives. This means that where there are cases, the government can quickly implement targeted measures and focus control efforts where they are needed most. Other countries like France Germany, the Republic of Korea, Spain, Italy, and the United Kingdom had major outbreaks of the virus, but when they took action, they were able to suppress it. Many countries globally are now using all the tools at their disposal to tackle any new spikes. Over the last few days, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson put areas of Northern England under stay-at-home notifications as clusters of cases were identified. In France, President Macron introduced compulsory masking in busy outdoor spaces of Paris in response to an increase in cases. Strong and precise measures like this, in combination with utilizing every tool at our disposal, are key to preventing any resurgence in disease and allowing societies to be reopened safely. And even in countries where transmission is intense, it can be brought under control by applying an all-of-government, all-of-society response. Chains of transmission have been broken by combination of rapid case identification, comprehensive contact tracing, adequate clinical care of pa for patients, physical distancing, mask wearing, regular cleaning of hands, and coughing away from others. Whether countries or regions have successfully eliminated the virus, suppressed transmission to a low level, or are still in the midst of a major outbreak, now is the time to do it all. Invest in the basics of public health, and we can save both lives and livelihoods. In the countries that have done this successfully, they're using a risk-based approach to reopen segments of societies including schools. And as they do so, they must remain vigilant for potential clusters 
of the virus. We all want to see schools safely reopened, but we also need to ensure that students, staff, and faculty are safe. The foundation for this is adequate control of transmission at the community. My message is crystal clear. Suppress, suppress, suppress the virus. If we suppress the virus effectively, we can safely open up societies. As countries work to suppress COVID-19, we must further accelerate our work to rapidly develop and equitably distribute the additional tools we need to stop this pandemic. Just over three months ago, we launched the ACT Accelerator as the fastest and most effective way to do this. It's the only end-to-end -end global solution that combines public and private sector expertise in research and development, manufacturing, procurement, and delivery for the tools needed to address the pandemic's cause. The ACT Accelerator has already harnessed the international public health ecosystem in a unique way of working with early proof of its potential. The accelerator-supported vaccines are in phase two and three trials. A global vaccines facility is engaging over 160 countries. The first therapy for severe COVID dexamethasone is in scale-up. Dozens of other promising therapies are under analysis. Over 50 diagnostics are in evaluation, including potentially game-changing rapid antigen tests. And a comprehensive framework for allocating these scarce tools for greatest global impact is under consultation. The coming three months present a crucial window of opportunity to scale up the work of the ACT Accelerator for global impact. However, to exploit this window, we have to fundamentally scale up the way we are financing the ACT Accelerator and prioritize the use of new tools. There is a vast global gap between our ambition for the ACT Accelerator and the amount of funds that have been committed. While we are grateful for those that have made contributions, we are only 10% of the way to funding the billions required to realize the promise of the ACT Accelerator. And this is only part of the global investment needed to ensure everyone everywhere can access the tools. For the vaccines alone, over 100 billion will be needed US dollars. This sounds like a lot of money, and it is. But it is small in comparison to the $10 trillion that have already been invested by G20 countries in fiscal stimulus to deal with the consequences of the pandemic so far. I would like to close by saying a few words about the explosion in Lebanon that last Tuesday killed over 150 people, injured more than 6,000, and left over 300,000 people homeless. To the people of Beirut, we held workers and emergency workers on the ground our thoughts are with you, you, and we will continue to support you. From our strategic stockpile in Dubai, WHO immediately sent surgical and major trauma supplies. We released funds from the Contingency Fund for Emergencies, and our staff are on the ground supporting the assessment of the impact on the health sector with Lebanese and other UN partners. We're shipping 1.7 million US dollars worth of PPE items to support COVID and humanitarian supplies that were destroyed by the blast. We're also working closely with national health authorities to enhance trauma care, including through the deployment and coordination of qualified emergency medical teams. We're also mitigating the COVID-19 impact, addressing psychosocial needs, and facilitating the rapid restoration of damaged health facilities. We have issued an appeal for 76 million US dollars and ask for your solidarity and support to the Lebanese people. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. So we'll now open the floor to questions.
I, if you wish to ask a question, please use the raise your hand icon to get in the queue. And I'll also apologize now to those who are waiting. We cannot ask all the questions, but please ask only one question to give others a chance. The first question goes to Stephanie Neberhe from Reuters, the Geneva correspondent in Reuters. Stephanie, unmute yourself, please, and ask your question. Stephanie Neberhe, did you hear uh, you have the first question? Can you unmute yourself and go ahead? Okay, um, Stephanie, we'll try and come back to you. Uh, we now have Jim Roop, Westwood One, on the line. Jim has been staying up very late to ask his question. So, Jim, could you unmute yourself and please go ahead? Well, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my question is about the vaccine, or a vaccine, if you will. It, there are vaccines for other viruses. Vaccines have been discovered. Is there... I really want to get this question right, so bear with me. Is there a key to finding that vaccine? Is there something about the virus that each virus has in common uh, that is the thing that is is what scientists are going after? So is there something that you have learned from, let's say, a polio vaccine that could help in developing a vaccine for uh, this SARS-CoV-2 virus, is there a common link or something, a key, a specific target that you're looking for in this virus that would, that would say, aha, that's the thing we need to get, we're able to create a vaccine now? Thank you. I can, I can start with uh, Bruce, who's uh, more skilled than me in this area, may want to supplement. I, I think, um, um, all of the vaccines or many of the vaccines that are currently under development uh, focus in one way or another in trying to generate an immune response to usually what is a, a protein that's on the surface of the virus. And you've seen, many of you have seen the pictures of the virus with these spikes that stick out. It's called the coronavirus. Corona is the, uh, comes from the root for crown, I think from the Latin. So the corona of the virus are these proteins that stick out. And these proteins are what allow the, the virus to attach to human cells and enter the cell. So that's almost like a, uh, the, 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 the virus can poke its way through the, the receptors on the surface of human cells and enter the cell in that way. And once the virus enters the cell, its nucleic acids, its RNA can instruct the human cell to produce more of the virus. And when enough of the virus is produced, the cell bursts and is killed and more virus is spread. So you can imagine that each time a virus infects a cell, it's a chain reaction uh, inside the body. So what you want to try and do is generate as quickly as possible an immune response specifically to those proteins. Uh, and uh, the vaccine candidates that are currently under development either <coughs> present a protein like that, uh, that's uh, in another virus, uh, sometimes it's genetically engineered virus, a harmless virus that expresses that protein, uh, sometimes it's a, a weakened version of the coronavirus itself, and sometimes uh, some of the vaccines actually have the instructions to make that protein, so the, uh, the vaccine actually instructs the, the body to make, uh, to make those proteins for which there is then an immune response. So the key, I suppose, is making sure that we've identified that proper target. Have we targeted the right proteins, particularly those on the surface of the cell? Uh, but Bruce can speak. We can develop vaccines <clears throat> And I believe huge progress has been made, and credit to all the researchers out there that are doing that work. Uh, and I believe we will uh, uh, get vaccines that are both safe and, eff and, and, and effective. Uh, the challenge is going to be uh, scaling up the production, allocating those vaccines in a way that does the most good around the world and stops this virus to the greatest extent possible, paying for all of that and preparing national systems to deliver this. As I've said before here in press conferences, we have perfectly effective polio vaccines, perfectly effective measles vaccines, and we still struggle to eradicate or eliminate those diseases. So having an effective vaccine is only part of the answer. You have to have enough of that vaccine, the right people have got to have access to that vaccine, and you've got to be able to deliver that vaccine to a population that want and demand to have that vaccine. Bruce? 
Thank you, Mike. That's an excellent question, uh, uh, Jim. Uh, my name is Bruce Aylward, by the way, and I'm uh, coordinating heading the work of the ACT Accelerator. And when it comes to a key to finding the vaccine, like Mike said, there are intrinsic properties of that vaccine. And in this case, we're looking for what uh, generates that uh, immune response that's going to um, uh, neutralize the, the virus, as Mike said. And the, the common target is the spike protein. And what's interesting about the coronavirus uh, vaccine development, you will have heard this al al already in so many places, is the fact that multiple different approaches are being taken to that. There's five, six, seven different major approaches to try and generate immunity to that spike protein. Um, the advantage of having those multiple different approaches comes to the second part of this issue, Jim, and it's not simply a matter of generating immune response and having a great vaccine, but then as Mike alluded to, you've got to be able to get that vaccine into people. So you're also looking at programmatic characteristics. Does this vaccine work in all age groups and all different populations? Does this vaccine also, what are its characteristics in terms of how it has to be stored, how stable it is? Because those characteristics can be as important as the characteristics of the vaccine itself when it comes to getting it out into the large scale use we're going to need. Um, especially in the case of this pandemic. And of course, on that side, thanks to the fabulous work being done by so many institutions, so many investigators, we're in very good shape in terms of um, potential for generating the right kind of uh, product in, this, uh, in the case of COVID-19. Thank you very much, Dr. Aylwood. My apologies for not uh, introducing Dr. Aylward before. As, as he mentioned, he's uh, the senior advisor to the Director General and he's in charge of the ACT Accelerator and COVAX facility. And uh, is here to he's here to answer all those difficult questions <laughs> on that huge area of work. Our next question comes from, uh, we're going, our next question is from Tony from CGTN. Tony, could you please unmute yourself and go ahead with your question? Thank you very much for taking my question. Um, Dr. Tedros in his opening statement said uh, that there are essentially two elements to addressing the pandemic effectively, that leaders must step up to take action and that citizens need to embrace new measures. Uh, for weeks now in Europe, we have been in the grip of what many fear is a second wave. So I'm curious how the WHO views this resurgence. Does it see it as a second wave? And also, is it a lack of the strong leadership or the citizens not embracing the new measures, which is to blame for the rising numbers? I think um, we, and, and, and I don't think anyone has said differently, there, there was always a likelihood that diseases, we have said it, would, would spike and there would be flare-ups of the virus, because until the virus is gone, there's always a chance of flare-ups. Uh, countries in, in Europe <clears throat> deserve a lot of credit for the work they did, and particularly their populations did, to suppress the virus. But it's not suppressed throughout all, all of Europe, uh, and there are significant uh, issues still with transmission in parts of uh, Central and Southern Europe that still remain to be fully under control. Uh, countries in Western Europe, in general, have suppressed uh, the majority of virus transmission and are now seeing uh, um, uh, flare-ups of that disease. Um, the, the trick for them now is to really focus on identifying those clusters of disease, identifying any new uh, community transmission, and putting in place the kind of localized measures that can contain the virus, suppress the virus, and reduce exposure, uh, and try to avoid, uh, if possible, having the sort of countrywide lockdowns that had did so much economic damage uh, before. That does require a very sophisticated approach. It requires very localized data. It requires very rapid turnaround of testing. It requires very fast investigation of clusters and the implementation of measures as localized as possible. Uh, and I, that will be what countries in Europe and countries around the world really need to fake focus on, is how fast and how speedy, how effective is your response to those uh, inevitable flare-ups? And are you able to shut down transmission as quickly as possible and move on to the next flare-up? And then, and I know that's not what people want to hear, but that is the reality. Once you get the disease down to a low level, you will have flare-ups. What you do about those flare-ups and how localized you can be in the surgery that's needed to, cut, uh, to, to remove the virus uh, really comes down to how well you've invested 
in your ability to do surveillance, to do quarantine, to do tracing, uh, and do all of those other things. Um, so no, I wouldn't characterize, everyone's been speaking about waves and spikes and, and everything else. The reality is that, and I've said it before, that in a classic vir uh, uh, epidemiology of viruses, in the absence of control measures, very often viruses can show seasonal patterns. We've certainly seen that with influenza. This virus has demonstrated no seasonal pattern as such so far. What it has clearly demonstrated is, you take the pressure off the virus, the virus bounces back. That's the reality, that's the fact. You can call that a second wave, you can call that a second spike, you can call that a flare-up, you can call it anything you like. Take the pressure off this virus, the virus will bounce back. And that's what we will say to countries in Europe, keep the pressure on the virus. The DG said it, suppress, suppress, suppress. If I could just supplement that. So just to say, I, I completely agree with everything uh, Mike has just said there. Just to answer the second part of that question. So you, you use the word, um, what is to blame in your question? And I think we need to avoid the use of the word blame here because what we are seeing and what we have expected and what everyone should expect is that this virus likes people, it likes an opportunity to spread. And if we give it an opportunity, it will. So what we're trying to express in beyond the all of government, all of society approach, strong leadership, clear national plans, um, strong local implementation, especially where it is needed, is to empower communities. Uh, we would like everyone on the planet to understand what their role is in this fight against COVID-19, to manage your own risk um, in terms of what you do every day, uh, in terms of deciding if you can, um, if you are asked to stay home, please stay home. But if you do need to leave your house to do different things, to follow the national guidance. If you're asked to wear a mask and you go in shops or you go on public transportation, please do so. Um, if you could avoid crowded places, if you could avoid indoor settings with poor ventilation, manage your own risk. Reduce the opportunity for you to become exposed to this virus. Because not only are you pre uh, preventing an opportunity from yourself from getting infected, you prevent the opportunity for this virus to pass from you to somebody else who could potentially be in a more vulnerable uh, grouping. Um, so again, we're still learning about this virus, but we know that if the virus has an opportunity to spread, it will. And it hasn't gone away. As Mike has said, there is no indication that there is seasonality with this virus. The virus is still circulating. Uh, we know that the majority of the population still remains susceptible to infection. And so we have to do everything that we can to prevent infections and save lives. So do it all. Physical distance, wear a mask where appropriate, make sure you pra practice respiratory etiquette, avoid crowded settings, follow national guidance, be informed. Um, all of this needs to be done every day. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff and Dr. Ryan. The next question, we'll try Stephanie Nebehe again. Stephanie, if you're back on, could you unmute yourself and ask your question? Okay. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can, can that's me? great. Yes, we can hear you well now. Go ahead. Um, so, uh, going into the point exclusively last Friday, that Germany and France um, have backed away from taking part in G7 uh, talks um, led by the U.S. Um, reforming WHO, um, saying that the whole administration should give notice that it's leaving, um, you know, should not be on leading this process. So my question is, how important is it to WHO that this process, that the G7 average uh, powers be, you know, united and speak with one voice? And, um, in their efforts to follow up on the uh, Stephanie, it wasn't very easy to hear your question. It was quite garbled. I, I think you were asking about the G7 discussions that were around WHO, and you were asking how important that is to WHO. Was that the essence of your question? Yes. Can you hear me? No, oh, better. Better now. Yeah. Okay. The Reuters reported last Friday that Germany and France have distanced and have quit the talks, uh, the G7 talks, uh, with as the U.S. is trying to uh, lead these talks, despite having said they're lead, they are quitting the organization. So my question is, how important is it to WHO that the major powers sort of speak with one voice and follow up, um, you know, the WHO resolution uh, aimed at 
learning lessons and reforming WHO. Thanks. Um, yes, uh, uh, well, uh, I'll pick up on the last point, Stephanie, there. I mean, the, the resolution that was agreed, uh, the resolution 73.1 of the last World Health Assembly, uh, contains a, a large number of actions to be taken by WHO and the member states, including the, the comprehensive evaluation of the, of the response uh, thus far, but many others around the uh, ACT Accelerator and vaccines, around surveillance, around uh, so many other things that the world needs to get on and do together, both now and into the future. Uh, we know the G20 have also been discussing this issue of global preparedness now and into the future. Um, we know the European Union have been doing that, and many different uh, uh, regional and global bodies have been really uh, sitting up and taking notice of the fact that this pandemic has come, this pandemic has taken people by surprise, uh, and we need to, to do better in future in order to, uh, to stop pandemics like this and invest in the long-term solutions. So we're always pleased when bodies like the G7, the G20, the European Union, uh, ASEAN, and so many others get together and really take these issues seriously. And obviously the G7 been some of the, most, the richest and most powerful nations in the world, and organizations that quite frankly have invested a tremendous amount technically, operationally, and financially in the World Health Organization. It's always a good thing when they're talking about global health, when they're talking about the threat of pandemics and how we work our way out of this one. So we welcome those engagements. We are not uh, part of those uh, discussions or negotiations. Um, and <clears throat> we would leave it to the participants in that discussion to clarify what their positions are in that discussion. We trust that such powerful uh, and capable nations uh, will uh, have consensus around how they wish to approach the global health security. We, are, we all occupy one planet. Uh, we are all vulnerable to the risks anywhere on this planet, and we need to find global solutions, both in terms of preparedness and response. And, and we trust that uh, the G7 will play uh, a major part in that in the months and years to come. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. The next question comes from Clive Cookson of the Financial Times. Clive, could you unmute yourself and please go ahead? Uh, thank you, yes. This is a less political question, but I'm interested in what you are making of the um, increasing talk about um, exposure to other coronaviruses in the human populations, the sorts that give you less um, severe symptoms, common colds. There's talk that this might give some form of um, cellular immunity to as much as 20 to 40 percent of the population in some places. It might account for some of the huge varieties in um, symptoms, infection rates, even among particular population groups. I know it's not yet clear, but I'd love to know where you think the evidence lies on that at the moment. Thank you. So thanks for this question. This is a, it's a very good one. Um, you did answer your question and say that it isn't quite clear yet, but um, having said that, this is, a, this is an area of active discussion amongst our groups, amongst our international networks. And what you're referring to are the common cold coronaviruses that circulate globally, there are four of them. Um, and what that means for somebody who has been infected with one of those coronaviruses, does it mean that they have some level of protection for the, co the COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus? Um, we don't have an answer to that yet. Uh, what we're discussing um, with our laboratory networks, um, and particularly labs that have experience with doing uh, T cell response or a cellular uh, response, is trying to understand if somebody has a T-cell response for SARS-CoV-2, what does that mean? Um, does it mean that they've been exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, and have antibody or have the T-cell response to that? Or did they have a, an exposure to another human coronavirus? We don't have a complete answer yet. Um, so this is called cross-reactivity. And we're trying to understand what this means in terms of potential protection, um, if any. Um, to this new virus that emerged uh, at, the, at the beginning of this year um, and what that means going forward. So what we're trying to do is design some basic studies that need to be done in the laboratory to look at what uh, T cell response is and look at cross reactivity. Um, these studies can only be done in a, in a handful of labs globally, so we're partnering with those labs to better understand. 
In addition to that, we're looking at adding a T cell response to some of the seroepidemiology studies that we are supporting globally. So we can look at both an antibody response and a T cell response to see what it actually means in individuals and look at that over time. Um, but we don't have a complete answer to that yet. Uh, but I can assure you that we have incredible scientists that are working directly with us on this and with all of you to help us better disentangle what this means. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. We now have a question from India, from Av uh, Avijit in, uh, from AM News TV, India. Avijit, please um, unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for taking my question. Can you hear me now? Very well. Please go ahead. So, uh, Dr. Van, uh, uh, Dr. Van Kerkhoff just mentioned that uh, WHO is still learning about uh, the virus. Uh, vaccines are a far cry, and the economy is absolutely shattered all over. So now, my question is, the virus emanated from China, Wuhan province. So where does the investigation stand, and what are the actions being taken so that in, in future such things do not happen, and this virus, and what is the status of this virus worldwide? Yes, I'll just clarify your question. So you're asking about the investigation into the origins of the virus, and you're asking about uh, the setting up of the mission to investigate. Is that correct? Yes, yes, absolutely. So I could start at the, the, the public health importance of looking at the source, the zoonotic source of the virus. So normally what happens is wherever the first cases emerged, um, and in this case, the first cases were identified in Wuhan, China, that's where the, the studies begin. You start there and you look at what were the exposures of these individuals, you look back in time, you look forward in time to really determine what are the types of activities that those individuals did um, in terms of travel, in terms of exposure occupationally, in terms of everything that they did in their daily life before they developed symptoms. And then you, and then you move from there and you follow the science is what we say. Um, we've did, done something similar for the first SARS virus um, in 2003. We did the same thing for the MERS coronavirus in 2012, 2013, where we needed to do these studies at the animal-human interface, we call it. And we basically look at what are the types of exposures that people had to determine where the animal uh, origin uh, came from. So those are where the studies will begin, and that's what will happen with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um. Yes, and it's important as well, I think in general, uh, just to reflect on what we've learned about the virus in terms of its the ease of spread, the multiple modes of transmission, the existence of uh, asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission. This virus is proving exceptionally difficult to stop. Uh, it's difficult to recognize, it's difficult to distinguish between it and other syndromes unless you have adequate and immediate testing. You're seeing that now in countries with influenza and with COVID at the same time. So this is not an easy virus, uh, and not an easy virus either to detect, it's not an easy virus to stop. Um, and the, obviously the first clusters of cases were certainly picked up in Wuhan, and that's where an epidemiologic investigation would always start. But that does not, and we've done this, and I've done this for over a quarter of a century now, uh, case zero is not always where your first cluster is. Case zero can be, it's usually, it's obviously before in time, but it may be in another place. So that's why you have to keep an open mind. All hypotheses are on the table. You start with an open mind. Um, and you follow the, the evidence and you follow the data. And if you follow the data and the science, you will find, hopefully, the, the point at which the disease crossed the species barrier. But I will remind you that it, it has taken decades in other diseases to do that. It took years to do it in the case of MERS. It's never been fully established in the case of SARS uh, in terms of the, the actual event that uh, crossed the animal-human barrier. And it does prove uh, very, very difficult to find that uh, initiation point where the disease crossed the animal-human uh, species barrier. But it is important that we find that because as long as the animal-human breach has not been discovered, there's always a chance that, that that barrier can be breached again. And that's why we always, in Ebola, in Nipah, in many, many other diseases, we always seek to find the case zeros in order to find that breach in the barrier. <clears throat> and we are at greater and greater risk around the world. 
and uh, let's, let's face this, we live in a planet in which we're adding a billion people a decade. We are uh, densely packed. We are exploiting pristine environments. Uh, we are creating and driving the ecologic pressure that is creating the risks that are driving the risk at the animal-human species barrier. And there are so many people out there working in the, in the ecologic movement who are seeing this each and every day. We are pressuring the, the biologic system. We live in a biome. Uh, we live in a, in a, in a, in a world um, of biology. And we are creating, actively creating, the pressures that are driving the breaches of those barriers. And we need to do better uh, at managing the risks associated with that. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan and Dr. Van Kerkhoff. The next question comes from Brazil, from Lurival Santana of CNN Brazil, who's going to ask her question in Portuguese, I understand. Lurival, could you please unmute yourself and go ahead? I'll do it in English, and thank you for the opportunity. Brazil has reached the 100,000 deaths, and President Bolsonaro keeps addressing this as an unavoidable fact by saying he's sorry for deaths from all causes. And now that he has gone through the disease, he is still more confident in advertising hydroxychloroquine as a silver bullet, to use Dr. Treders, Treders uh, expression. Our president thinks social distancing is not necessary, and he is suspicious of Chinese vaccines. So the Brazilian government does not provide enough financial assistance for poor people to stay at home. What should Brazilians do under these circumstances to protect themselves against this virus? And is there anything wrong with Chinese vaccines? Thank you. Um, that's uh, a lot of questions in one on uh, the, um, in, in terms of looking at the, the various things, certainly Brazil continues to have uh, between 50 and 60,000 cases a day. Uh, the the R naught or the, the reproductive number for the, the disease varies between about 1.1 and 1.5, so the disease is still actively spreading across uh, most of the country. Um, intensive care units uh, still cope, and uh, again, it's a tremendous uh, credit to the healthcare workers of Brazil. They have been at this for months now, uh, and uh, hospital occupancy and ICU occupancy now in many places uh, exceeds 80%, in some cases exceeding 90%. Uh, uh, anybody who works in an intensive care unit in an infectious disease situation recognizes the stresses and the strains on those individuals and their families, and sustaining that for months is an almost uh, impossible task. Um, COVID positivity rates in those tested are still very high, uh, so, uh, uh, over 20% in many cases. So a lot of the indicators uh, for Brazil are really pointing towards continued community transmission, continued pressure on the health system, um, and uh, that continued, even though cases are only increasing by maybe uh, 10, 11, 12 percent a week, when you look at the base number, that's, that, that, that's, that's very large. Brazil is sustaining a very high level of epidemic. Uh, the curve has somewhat flattened, but it's not going down. And the system is under uh, a great deal of pressure. And, and with respect, uh, in a situation like that, uh, hydroxychloroquine is not a solution and, and, uh, and not a silver bullet. Um, it is the sovereign right of any nation to uh, decide what it believes is the best treatment and the best course of action for clinically managing disease. Uh, at present, from all of the randomized control trials, that have been published, uh, the hydroxychloroquine is not proven to be an effective treatment against uh, COVID-19. Um, with regard to um, uh, social distancing or physical distancing, masks and others, again, the DG has said it. We need to sustain those activities. And he says, do it all, hand washing, social distancing, masks. It is, though, difficult for many, many people in Brazil, and many people live in situations of overcrowding and poverty, where doing that and sustaining that kind of activity is very, very difficult. And the government should be supporting communities in being able to, to... It's very hard to act as a community if you're not supported. And when Maria spoke about community empowerment, that's not, uh, that's not just empowering people with words. You need to empower people with deeds. 
Uh, you need to empower people with resources. You need to empower people with knowledge. Uh, and they have to be able to act. Communities can't act with two hands tied behind their backs. They need to be given the resources, the means, and the knowledge to act. Um, with regard, finally, to the issue of vaccines, there are a number of vaccines under trial, uh, including uh, two uh, Chinese vaccine candidates that are going through exactly the same types of trials that all of the other vaccines, the other four candidates that are currently in phase three. Bruce might speak to more coming. I think more are coming through the pipe in terms of uh, the 32 vaccines that are currently in some form of uh, trial. Um, and each and every one of those vaccines will be put through the exact same rigorous phase three trials and further <clears throat> into uh, phase four and, 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 and roll out to, to communities. So uh, uh, there is at this point no need to be suspicious of any vaccine at that point. What we need to look to is the safety and efficacy trials. WHO and our strategic our scientific advisory group on immunization will be keeping a very close eye on the outcomes of those uh, trials and uh, WHO will not be issuing policy guidance regarding any vaccine unless we have seen, examined and looked at the data to ensure the safety and efficacy of any vaccine. Bruce, anything to add on vaccines? Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. So our next question comes from Robin Millard of Associate, uh, uh, Agence France Presse. Uh, Robin, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Very well, please ask your question. Okay, it's a question about the, the virus. Um, obviously, we, we all know what uh, we as, uh, as human beings are trying to do. Our objective is to try and uh, suppress the virus and, and eliminate it. What is the objective of the virus um, when you talk about know your enemy? What is the virus trying to do? I'm going to uh, start. Maria will come in. Uh, I, I think it is important. I think when we talk about what is the virus trying to do and the virus being an enemy, uh, the virus doesn't have a brain. We're the ones with the brains. Uh, the virus is a very simple biologic entity that can enter a human cell and instruct that cell to make more viruses, which can ultimately kill the person it infects, or at the very minimum, transmit to another person. It's brutal in its simplicity. It is brutal in its cruelty, uh, but it doesn't have a brain. We have the brains. And I think Maria may outline how we can outsmart something that doesn't have a brain, but uh, we're not doing such a great job right now. So th thanks for this question. In fact, I, I've always anticipated this, this kind of question of someone asking us what, I mean, the goal of a virus is to make more virus. Um, the goal of a virus is to, I would use the word survive if it was alive, but it's not alive. Um, it wants to reproduce. It wants to find individuals to pass between. But it also doesn't want to kill too many because if it kills its host, then it can't pass to another person. So what we can do to outsmart it and I think, uh, as, as Mike has said, there's many, many, many things that we can do right now with the tools that we have right now to outsmart this virus. And I think that's the unique thing about this particular pandemic. We are all in support of rapidly addressing therapeutics and vaccines, and that will continue. Uh, but right now, we have tools that can stop transmission, that can break chains of transmission. Uh, what we need to do with this virus is to keep ourselves separated from somebody who is infected. And what we keep saying with this physical distancing is that keeping at least one meter away from individuals, from others, provides enough of a distance. If you could, if you could be more distant, great, but at least one meter between people. If we can isolate cases, so people who are known to be infected with this virus, whether they have symptoms or not, if we isolate them from others, we don't allow the virus to pass from somebody else. If we carry out what is called contact tracing, where we identify the contacts of a known case and we put those individuals in quarantine, which separates them from others, we prevent that virus, if those contacts are infected, from passing to somebody else. We uh, uh, support the use of masks in areas where you cannot do physical distancing. We support the use of masks for healthcare workers who are caring for known patients. Um, there are many, many things you can do. You can clean your hands. It is very unsophisticated, but in many parts of the world, this is a luxury to be able to do. Make sure you have clean water, you have soap, you have an alcohol-based rub, you inactivate the virus that's on your hands, and you don't inoculate yourself. 
all of these things, if we do all of these things, we can outsmart the virus and we can prevent this virus from passing from one individual to another. So thank you very much for that question. I think everybody on the planet needs to understand that they have a role to play. No matter where you live, no matter what occupation you have, no matter what age you are, you can be part of breaking the chains of transmission. Ryan for those uh, great answers. Uh, we're well past the 45 minutes. I think we've only got time for one more question. And that will go to Shoko from NHK Japan. Shoko, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Hello, Margaret. Can you hear me? Very well. Please go ahead. Thank you for taking my question. So my question is about Japan. So after the first peak in April, we have experienced a quite stable period for about two months. But since the end of July, the number of com uh, confirmed cases exceeds uh, 1,000 or sometimes 1,500 per day. What advice do you have to countries, countries like Japan who are experiencing the, the resurgence like this? Thank you. Um, uh, yes, and in, in Japan, in some senses, is experiencing something similar to Europe. Um, but I think, um, and again, I would commend Japan on the approach they've taken. They've really had to deal with, uh, because Japan, Korea, and others have had lower numbers for a longer time, they've been dealing with spikes and flare-ups for months now. Uh, Japan has already had a number of flare-ups flare and spikes going back at two or three months and has managed to contain those by localized measures very often and really focused on very powerful, very strong uh, cluster-based investigation. And they've gone after each and every cluster. They've examined each of those clusters in terms of the epidemiology and they've identified the sort of risk behaviors associated with the generation of those clusters. The other thing Japan has done is, is really looked at who is transmitting the disease. And the majority of people in the Japanese context do not transmit the disease to another person. And in fact, it's a smaller number of individuals who are transmitting disease to others. <clears throat> and very often that is driven by the context in which the transmission occur. Crowded spaces, places, closed spaces, areas where there's close contact settings, uh, the kind of nightclubs, uh, social gatherings, churches, and other situations. And by doing this, Japan is really starting to pick apart transmission inside Japan, looking for those highest risk behaviors, looking for those highest risk environments, and then taking action at that level, locally, surgically, trying to reduce those activities, close down those spaces that are most risky, and then dealing with that step by step by step. So I, I do think Japan deserves a lot of credit. Certainly in, in the data that I've seen, I've not seen another country in reality that's produced as much really granular information on what's going on cluster by cluster by cluster. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, when a country and when an authority truly understands the nature, type, and local levels of transmission, and once you understand the problem at that level, that gives you a huge opportunity to intervene. Uh, and it means you can intervene in a way that's not so brutal, does not have to be so population-based or, or, or widespread. <clears throat> Bruce, you spent uh, <clears throat> time uh, looking at this in China and other places. I mean, I don't know if you have observations on, on, on Japan and what they've been doing. I think, Mike, to the point you made, the response in Japan, like so many countries, has been extremely impressive. And this, but the question comes back a little bit to the last question. What's the virus trying to do? And like Maria said, the virus is trying to get from person to person. And what we can do, we need to make it more difficult for the virus. It's as simple as that. We're not making it hard for the virus. We're coming together, we're clustering, we're coughing over each other, and everybody needs to be asking themselves all the time right now in the face of a, um, you know, a globally uh, endemic virus at this point, Am I making it more difficult for this virus to pass from one to another? It's as simple as that at the end of the day. And like Mike says, everything we talk about, finding the virus, isolating the cases, tracing the contacts, it's all about making it more difficult for the virus. This is not rocket science. This is simple, but it takes a certain amount of discipline and it takes a certain amount of commitment by a global community now to stop this thing but it's definitely stoppable, and we definitely have the knowledge and the tools already to do being, be slowing it down a lot more than we are. 
maybe just as well, and I think what Japan has also done is, is not simplify, but really distill the public messaging down to something that people can really get a hold of. Uh, they, they speak very much about, uh, in terms of transmission, they talk about uh, avoiding the, the three C's, the closed spaces, the crowded places, and the close contact settings. So people really are, are triggered to really look hard at them when they get in themselves into those situations. And when they are in those situations and they can't avoid those situations, they're given three more instructions, you know, uh, open the windows for ventilation, minimize the conversation, wear a mask. So I, I, I think we can learn a lot from uh, the, because people are overloaded with information and, and we're all, you know, we're just, it's a deluge, it's a, it's a tsunami. And I think governments could really look at how do we, not simplify, simplification is the wrong word because it sounds like you're dumbing it down, you're not. You're really trying to distill down the key behaviours that are going to protect you and protect others. And I think if, you're to, if you want to avoid, if you believe your, your main mode of transmission is clusters, and that's what's happening in Japan, and you want to stop clusters, if you believe that most people don't transmit the disease but do in these particular situations, then you want to reduce risk in those situations, and you want everybody reducing risk in those situations. And then you try and give the simplest, most implementable message. Don't give me instructions that I can't follow. Give me instructions that I can follow. And I think people are crying out for that. Uh, and I think Japan, you know, n no country is perfect in all of this. Uh, Japan has had its struggles, but I too do think Japan deserves a lot of credit for the science-based approach uh, that it has taken to this response. Just, just to add, so we have, we have quite a lot to say for this answer. Just to say on that last point that Mike just mentioned on this science approach, this data-driven approach, I think one of the other things that we've learned from, from Japan and many other countries is the ability to, do, to be more specific, to be more targeted based on data. So one of the things that they've also looked at is within these clusters, they've noticed an, a shift in the age in the, in the populations that are actually being infected. This is driven by nightclubs, it's dri dri driven by social contacts and the way that people crowd and come together. And by knowing that, you could target your approach. You don't have to have a blanket close everything down. You can actually focus on where is this virus liking to circulate? Where does it like to circulate? Where can we close that down? Um, and that data-driven approach is really, really critical. We've said before, um, and, and that not everyone necessarily passes the virus to somebody else. We could prevent that from happening. But there's some really good estimates out there that suggest that between 10 and 20 percent of cases are responsible for about 80 percent of transmission events. And that's really, really important. That supports the nature of the epidemiology of this virus and that it likes clusters. It likes these super spreading events. If we give this virus the opportunity to spread in these close settings, it will. So we have to prevent that from happening. And, and Japan and other countries are really looking at the data from these outbreaks, doing detailed cluster investigations to be able to drive the next steps. Um, they've also learned quite a bit on long-term living facilities, you know, and preventing the virus from entering long-term facilities where we know it has had devastating effects in many countries. You can prevent those types of outbreaks from happening and save lives. So again, everything that we can do to, to collect the right types of information, do detailed investigations of where these clusters are happening. And if you're not in a position to do that, learn from other countries that are experiencing that so that we could have much more tailored, specific, targeted approaches in our, in our next actions. Thank you so much, Dr. Van Kerkhove, Dr. Ayer.